All right. Did you enjoy your lunch? So um, I hope you are uh, ready for uh, some more sessions. Uh, we might have one or two uh, coming in uh, a little bit late, but it's 1 p.m., so let's get started. Um, I'm happy to introduce two of my other colleagues. This is Andreas Halberg and Philip Orkeson. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I leave it up to you guys to uh, present what you're going to talk about, but it's something with coding patterns, right? Yes, it is. Uh, we're going to talk about secure coding patterns. And um, uh, this is, we're going to focus this, boil this down to four main concepts today. Uh, we're going to talk about trust. We're going to talk about things that change. We're going to talk about domain objects. And finally, about being pessimistic. So, trust. Uh, trust is an important, important concept in uh, secure coding. Um, but it can be really tricky to know who to trust. How do we control who we trust? How do we establish trust? Um, a lot of security issues in code uh, boil down to a poor understanding of how we uh, place our trust or where our software places its, its uh, trust. So you've seen this uh, circle of trust here illustrated by a circle. And uh, this concept applies very well to uh, secure development. So as an application or API or whatever you're developing, you're inside this circle of trust and you have all these things that are on the outside, untrusted stuff. And what we need to do is we need to understand where we place our trust boundary. And to really hammer this in, I'm going to burn your eyes out with this slide. So you see everything that's inside the trust boundary is trusted and everything outside is untrusted. And uh, so how, how does something become trusted? Because uh, if we don't trust something, there's really no way for our application to interact with it, and then it becomes pretty worthless, right? Well, we use validation, of course. And uh, uh, when you validate data, two things can happen, really. Either you decide to reject the data you're looking at, then you stay outside the circle of trust, and no, no harm is done, or you decide to trust the data, and you can move on with your application. And before moving on with the concept of trust, we're going to just quickly uh, describe uh, some things you might want to do when you validate data. Uh, so you might want to uh, run some canonicalization or normalization process on your data to remove complexity. And uh, an example of this is when you're working with, uh, with file paths or URLs, perhaps, you might want to uh, convert relative paths to absolute paths. You might want to clean up your data, remove uh, unwanted characters, and you might want to make sure that your data adheres to your, your particular domain. And when you're validating something, you should always use whitelisting. This is really important, uh, as opposed to using blacklisting. Uh, because would you rather, uh, during validation, list all valid cases or listing all valid cases? In which of these two would missing something be a bigger problem? That's pretty obvious. And also, listing all invalid cases can be um, pretty tricky or even impossible. Okay, so we have our trust boundary. We validate our data, how do we make this stand out in our actual code? So, Andreas, can you show us how to do this? Sure. Thank you, Philip. 
<clears throat> yes. Uh, okay, so you saw the circle of trust with the trust boundary, uh, which is really important to understand that there is a trust boundary, and if something comes from the outside, it's not trusted. Um, yeah, there was a final point there. Stricter is better, whitelisting. All right. Uh, so, how can we make trust a first class concept at trust boundaries? Uh, that's really what we want to achieve. We just don't want to know that there's a trust boundary somewhere. We want to see it. So if you look at this function, foo, it takes some input, bar, and uh, bar comes from the other side of the trust boundary, the untrusted red area. Uh, goes through validation, either rejected or it passes through, and then we do something with it. So the do something with it function is on inside the circle of trust. Uh, so there's nothing here that tells us where the trust boundary is. We can just we just know it's there. Maybe the maybe the fact that we're doing validation tells us something, but it's not really clear. So a simple but effective thing to do is just to rename the things, the stuff that is untrusted, with untrusted underscore. Uh, even if this uh, violates all the um, uh, what is that naming standard guidelines. In how many C sharp programmers are there? Hands up. All right, Java. Okay, so about 50-50. All right. Uh, so if we name this untrusted, then it becomes pretty clear that it comes in from the wrong side of the trust boundary. We validate it. We say, okay, now it's trusted. So we just remove the uh, untrusted prefix. So this is really useful uh, when you're doing code reviews. Uh, we have this function. It takes some bar, which is untrusted, and a fraud. But this data, what's that? Apparently, we trust this because it's not untrusted. So this uh, really helps uh, to have the untrusted stuff, the stuff that we implicitly trust without thinking about it, pop out in the code. So you can easily spot if you forgot to do validation somewhere. Uh, we can do this a little bit cleaner if we uh, perhaps have a validate method, and uh, of course that method throws an exception, and uh, if it doesn't, we get the bar uh, out of it, and we're good. Now, this is good, but there's really nothing here that forces us to do validation. Even if we named it this, we could just uh, assign untrusted bar to bar and we'd be on our way. So can we lift this one step higher and really uh, force ourselves to do uh, validation? What about something like this? Can we use generics um, to sort of wrap our object into a untrusted container that forces us to perform validation to get the value out of it? Look at how such a class might look. Let me just get this. Does this work here? Yeah, it works. All right. So this is the untrusted of T. And uh, we take the value in, assign it. This is a read-only class. Uh, nothing can change here. And then we have a getter for the value. Does anything want to see anything strange with this getter? Come on, first one. Anyone? Anyone? Well, it's private. How are we going to use this? How are we going to get the value out of it? It's, it seems like quite a useless thing to do. What we want is our validators should be the only ones that can get the value out of this, because then we're forced to push this value through a validator, and then we can get it. So in C Sharp, this, we have this assembly directive. Um, for those of you who don't know, assemblies in uh, .NET, it's uh, the packaging unit. It's like a, a jar file in Java. So there's this assembly directive that you can set on your assembly, which uh, internal is visible too. It means that everything that's internal in the assembly that we are right now, for example, this private getter, every, all of that should be visible to the assembly called validation. And you can have a, like a signing strong name uh, there also. But it's essentially uh, an assembly called validation can read this. So if we look at the, what we can put in the validation assembly, we can do a validator that takes an untrusted, calls a uh, template method, inner validate, and voila, it can get the value because it has access to it. So what we would do is we will implement, uh, implement the validator of, of T in our uh, concrete validators. So it looks something like this. We get an untrusted string in, and the only way to get the value out of this untrusted container is to run it through a validator. This uh, account number validator, it, which uh, uh, extends the validator class, probably has some uh, regular expression in it that uh, um, verifies that this is indeed an account number. And um, uh, of course you can still uh, cheat, you can do a do-nothing validator that just 
picks, uh, gets the value out. But at least you've, making the, you've made that conscious effort in bypassing the validation. So this is pretty neat. You got the, the trust boundary clearly visible. You're forced to validate to get the value out. And then you're good to go. Now in, uh, let's see, of course we have to, um, to create these untrusted objects. There's some, a little bit of glue code needed because it's not likely that you'll get an untrusted object in from the outside. You still have to remember where the trust boundary is and create it. Uh, unless you use some framework feature like uh, model binding in MVC, then you can create a model binder that uh, on the fly creates untrusted objects, untrusted wrappers of all the data that comes in. <clears throat> uh, are, there any, uh, are there any C++ programmers in the crowd? Wow, yeah, it's good. Uh, you're going to love this. It's, this becomes even better in uh, C++ because it has something called implicit constructors or implicit construction and uh, friend classes. So let's take a look at what that looked like. Here's uh, some C++ code. There's an integer at account number we call the create account method, which is, on, uh, which is a trust boundary. And this compiles in C++ because of implicit constructors. The compiler will find a way. It can see that there's a constructor uh, in the untrusted method that can take an int. In fact, it can take any value because it's a, it's a template. So it's really neat. You don't need that glue code at all. You just dick, you go through your methods and say, okay, untrusted, 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 and it just, just works. And then the uh, validation, validator would look something like this. Uh, you can get the value. So inheritors or implementers of validator can call get value and get the value out. So the untrusted pattern is something uh, that's really useful. Uh, you should uh, try it. And if you're not ready to go all the way with a pattern, just try the renaming. And really lift out your trust boundary. So we talked a lot about trust and that uh, we need to validate something before we can use it. But what if the data can be changed after we've trusted it, when it's inside the circle of trust? What if it pulls off its beautiful Tom Cruise face and uh, reveals itself to be the super villain? And um, Philip is going to show us some uh, problems and uh, solutions here. Yes, I am. So there's something called TOC2, or time of check to time of use. And as programmers, you've all seen this before and probably used it, uh, maybe without think, uh, thinking about it. Uh, but OK, uh, stepping back to our, uh, well, a variation of our foo example here. Uh, we have this uh, untrusted bar object, which is validated at the time of check, and then we're doing something with it, that's the time of use, right? So what happens if we send in a bar object, validates it, and then another thread modifies the bar, bar object? Uh, then it could be changed before we actually use it, and we leave ourselves open to a potential attack. This leads us to our second pattern today, immutability. And this is pretty much stuff that's passed over a trust boundary, should not be able to change. And this uh, doesn't matter which way, if you go from the outside of the trust boundary to the inside or the other way around, uh, objects that pass the trust boundary should not be able to change. So back to the code again. Uh, we're sending a bar object over this clear trust boundary. So how do we make sure it doesn't change? In Java, we would do something like this. Uh, this is a bar class. You see that it's um, uh, final. It's not possible to subclass it. You can't override methods. The internal state, in this case, just a string, frob, it's not possible to change it after construction. So this is an immutable class. And using immutability will also, uh, besides increasing your security, it will help with a bunch of other uh, issues that you might run into, like uh, race conditions and uh, well, concurrency in, in general. And uh, Andreas, would you please show us how to use this to fix some concurrency issues? Sure. Thank you, Philip. Uh, any, if you know what a race condition is, uh, hands up. That's almost uh, all of you. Then you know that a race condition uh, is something that happens when the output of some operation is dependent on the sequence or timing of events that are outside of our control. And typically it's uh, two threads or more threads that compete, race against each other for access to some shared resource. And depending on who comes first, different things happen. 
And this is, of course, uh, very prevalent in the web, because it's all threads. Every request is a separate thread. And um, apart from leading to really hard bugs, uh, race conditions can be a security problem as well. And let's take a look at an example how immutability can uh, help us. So consider uh, the example of uh, some wizard. We have a wizard on our web page. It's a three-step wizard. The user starts. The second step, he fills something out, and then submit it in, a th in the third step. So we might uh, conjure up a wizard class, uh, that which uh, we need to keep the data uh, in every step. So data here is the, the data that's supposed to be transferred between the steps, so we remember what the user filled in. And uh, which uh, user we are, uh, is we're identified by a GUID. Now, all of you uh, security-minded, concurrency-aware, multi-threaded uh, individuals, you, of course, feel uneasy when you see the static keyword there, because you know that you write something static in a web app and multi-threading, you're, you're uh, signing yourself up for a trip to misery land. And uh, that's true, and it's, it, maybe if we, uh, it might not be this conspicuous when you, uh, when you code this. Maybe you, you have a, uh, a dependency injection container, which uh, you register this wizard class as a singleton. Then you don't have this as a static variable, it's just a regular member a class var variable. Uh, but you still get the static behavior. So you might get, it's not that easy to see this. Now it's really easy, it just sticks out. Uh, but for the example, it's easier to write this way. So the first step, uh, user just uh, goes to the first page. Uh, we assign him a new uh, key for, the, for the, our dictionary and uh, give him the data. So nothing can really go wrong here. Then in, uh, let me just walk over here. Just have to look the one way the whole time. Um, step two, uh, the, the user has filled something out, uh, an entity ID, he wants to see some kind of entity. We, we don't know what it is at this case. So we uh, update the entity ID on the wizard data. And then in step three, uh, it's like the checkout. He, we check if the user has access to this object, and then we do something with it. So here I've marked the time of check to time of use uh, here. So anyone have an idea what could go wrong here? Just anyone? Okay, what if we do something here in between time of check to time of use? What if we call the step two again? What if an evil user figures this out and realizes that if I do my timing right, if I click F5 or you know, press the submit button or use an external tool like the uh, proxy we have or whatever, uh, then I can send in another request and I can get it right in between the time of check and time of use. Then I can get access to some entity that I don't uh, have access to. And the problem is, of course, that data is allowed to change. Because if we do wizard step two in between here, we update the uh, entity ID of the data object, because this, uh, this is all in, in memory. So because the data objects can change, we're uh, vulnerable to this thing. So how do we fix this? With immutability, of course. So instead, we use our class immutable data, implemented just as uh, Philip showed you in uh, Java. This is C-sharp, pretty much the same thing. So the first step looks uh, pretty similar. We just have another uh, way of creating the object there. So it's usually easier to make a, a factory a constructor method for these things. And here's the big difference. In step two, we, don't, we do not update a uh, property on the object. We can't because it's immutable. There's no way for us. And the only way to um, change it, really, or no, we can't change it. We have to make a new object and set uh, properties. So here's a convenience method called copy with that copies all the state of the object to a new object and sets this entity ID. Because this data probably has some other properties in it, like the frob or whatever. And then we put it back into our dictionary, and then step three looks exact, exactly the same. But now we're safe. Nothing can happen here. At least this time of check to time of use uh, cannot happen. Because data is immutable. There's nothing that can change in between the time of check to time of use. So. Making your objects immutable really has a nice effect on the code. It's not um, like a, it doesn't solve all the problems with concurrency and uh, multi-threading. Uh, if, if it did, you wouldn't need those uh, two billion books about multi-threading and concurrency that you saw in the slide before. But you can think of it as a nice uh, security spray that just makes the code more robust and easier to understand and less likely to give you these uh, talk to uh, problems. Uh, so, okay, we talked about trust, we talked about uh, immutability, stuff that change. Now, uh, let's put these two together with uh, domain modeling, and we're going to talk about something called domain-driven security. Philip. 
Yes. So, domain-driven security. This is a pretty straightforward concept. Uh, the name was coined by a Swedish developer at Omega Point like five years ago, I think. And um, before we uh, go into this, we're just quickly going to go back to this circle of trust. Uh, when you just use simple primitive data types or data structures and you perform validation on those, you can still be, uh, be pretty safe and secure. But it's uh, pretty hard to discern what's trusted and not trusted unless you start using some renaming scheme, as we showed before. Uh, you can't really look at an object and see this is trusted. So what we do instead here in uh, domain-driven security, we have the same kind of untrusted data, but from that we directly create domain objects with built-in validation during construction. So there's no way to construct a domain object without passing validation. In that case, you, you'll get an exception or uh, whatever fits in your language. Uh, so just as an example here, maybe this string represents an account number and an integer represents an order amount of some kind. And this is converted into actual objects instead of these primitive data types. So inside the trust boundary, we only use these objects, all functions, that operate on trusted data should only take domain objects as parameters or in data. And that way we assure that nothing untrusted ever gets inside our circle of trust. That's pretty easy really. So that's also very good because here when you look at the circle it's really clear, oh we're on the, either we're inside the trust boundary or we're on the outside. For example the database, oh of course that comes from outside the trust boundary. But if you have this domain uh, driven security, you get this, these things, this, the trust boundary works it out by itself because everything you fetch, everything you need to in, uh, interact with will be a domain object and it will have been validated. So you get security everywhere. Everything you get in, no matter from which uh, source it is, you know that it's validated because you work with the domain objects that you just pass around to your methods. And like Philip said, if you see a naked string or a, uh, a naked, in naked string, uh, <laughs> If you, you should be worried. If you see a primitive type, then uh, yeah, then you know, okay, this is, this is wrong. We shouldn't be here. We have to change this to a domain object. Sure. Exactly. And just to summarize, uh, so domain-driven security is, well, domain-driven design, really, but as applied to or used to improve security. Um, primitive data types and data structures, such as strings, integers, collection types, all that stuff, untrusted by default and you create domain objects from this untrusted data, it has built-in validation during construction, if validation fails you get an exception. Um, domain objects should really be immutable, it's not required but it's highly recommended, because otherwise you will still run into all these TOC2 problems that we showed earlier. And as Andrea said, with domain objects you automatically get validation everywhere not only where you think that you have something crossing a uh, trust boundary. There's, there's no way to use domain objects without validation. And just as a quick code example, here's uh, an account number class. Uh, it takes a string in the constructor. It's validated. If that fails, it throws an exception. There's no way to change the value after it has been constructed. So, uh, yeah, that's um, pretty easy to use. So, so far, we have looked at trust, things that change or not change, and the use of domain objects. Now we're going to bring you down just a bit and talk about being pessimistic. You should be pessimistic. You should always expect the worst. It's a great state of mind. I love how we finish with this one. We should have put it first, shouldn't we? we yeah. <laughs> it's really happy, go here happy concept. Leave the session crying. So if we look at this line of code, maybe you have a function that starts out something like this, maybe on the very, very first line. 
Uh, that's not very pessimistic. And you have a bunch of other code, obviously, and you use that for something. But what's this saying, really? On the very first line, you're saying, we haven't done anything yet, but we already succeeded. That's like the life coach uh, coding uh, yeah. standard. Yeah, I should do inspirational. <laughs> it's good in some ways, but security-wise, no. No, we haven't succeeded yet. So we have to fix that. False. Fixed. No, but what about all this other code? Uh, I'm going to show you uh, another code example, something you've seen before, probably several times. So what's, what's wrong with this, besides the obvious? If we think about the execution of this code, the value, the variable used as a return value here, that's going to be set to zero for most of the execution of this function. And that means success. So that's also a bit backwards. So if we um, look a bit further down in this code, the parts I cut out here, we see the actual verification function being called. And uh, there's really only one place in this entire function that you should set the return value to something other than an error code. Right? And that's here. That's the only place you know that everything passed validation and everything is fine. And you might also notice that I changed the name of the, uh, the return va variable. And that's because you, you shouldn't really mix your uh, return variable, your success state, with temporary internal states and return values. And just to fill in the blanks here, we start out with an error code, and we only set that to zero at one place. Yeah, so there's, there's really nothing wrong with using Goto statements if you use it like this when you just jump down. It can be really a powerful pattern and clean things up. But uh, if, if you, you start out pessimistic. If you start out pessimistic. If you take the life, co <laughs> life coach approach, then uh, yeah. you know, you're going to get thrown out somewhere from the middle of this block of code, and then you say success and you should say failure instead. Okay. So, four things to remember here. Um, you should identify your trust boundaries, know, uh, know where they are, and you uh, should know that immutability, <laughs> this uh, magic security spray, uh, you might enjoy domain-driven security, and being a pessimist will make you happy. So I think we actually have some time left. Yeah, let's see if there are some uh, questions. We have some more stuff that we put in here if, if there was time, but if you have any questions about the things we've, uh, I suppose about 10 minutes left, if you, anyone, anything? Untrusted pattern is crystal clear, <laughs> immutability. Yeah, all right, that's great. Nice. So let's uh, move on, yeah. But wait, there's more. Um, okay, so we haven't really prepared the rest of the slides all that well, but we have at least a couple of things that we can show. Uh, a useful pattern when working with secret or sensitive data, like uh, passwords or uh, crypto keys maybe, uh, is that you shouldn't really keep stuff in memory uh, longer than necessary. And uh, this applies to really all reusable resources as well. If you have some uh, built-in caching somewhere that gives you back the same object as you used before, if you store sensitive data in that, you will keep it in memory, uh, maybe without knowing about it. And uh, this also applies to, to uh, garbage collecting in languages that uh, uses that. So what you do is uh, you wrap all your sensitive data in domain objects, of course, but you make sure that in your destructors you zero out the sensitive data. Maybe uh, just fill it with random data or whatever. And as an added bonus to, to this, um, while you're already wrapping all your data, you could make sure that it's actually encrypted in memory. Um, 
that's maybe a bit too much for, for most, uh, most purposes, but if you keep stuff just using simple encryption, it doesn't have to be really secure, but you keep, you keep your data encrypted except when you actually request it. And of course, you have to have it in, in clear text. Uh, but this would have helped prevent some, some bugs that's uh, come up over, over the last few uh, uh, years. Really. Yeah, and if you're, if you're on the Windows platform, uh, .NET or native, there's, the, there's a native method called uh, uh, secure string. You can new up secure strings. Uh, which you, it's like a string builder, you append characters to it. It will be encrypted in memory with the machine key on the machine you're on. So it, you, the way you get it out is you have to um, do some native stuff and get a C string out of it. It's really usable from .NET also. But it uh, really helps you to uh, avoid leaking sensitive things uh, out of it. And you can uh, use this uh, secure string to uh, create like a secure buffer if you want to hold byte values. You can just wrap this secure string uh, in a, your own little code that uh, uses this at a, as a byte buffer instead. So it's really useful. It's really easy to use. So um, there's really no, no excuse. If you're writing a client application that takes a password, for example, you should put the password characters in a secure string. Because if someone gets a hold of uh, memory on your computer for uh, maybe a hibernation file, a page, paging file, uh, worst case example is if you're using... Uh, public key cryptography. If you have a private key, and the private key is in memory together with your plain text password, and then your identity or the user's identity is easily stolen. So if you're using passwords anywhere, uh, passing them around, don't pass them around as strings. If you're on Windows, pass them around as secure strings. I'm sure there's something in Java that has this also. I'm not uh, at the top no of my idea. head. Anyone know? Oh, all you Java programmers are eerily silent right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure there's something you can use there also. So. You can implement it in J and I. <laughs> J and I. Yeah, sounds like a soft drink. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do we have some more? Okay. Um, well, not, not really a pattern, but enforcing a coding standard will improve. I mean, in general, it will improve your code. And better code is probably indicative of a better, higher security baseline. So that's a good thing to consider. For example, brackets around single line if statements. We <laughs> use that yeah. example. So not only a matter of taste can also really help. Yeah, you can, if you have this religious discussion about using brackets or not, you can just kill them when saying, yeah, well, go to fail. Yeah. So. yeah. And I think that's really the last um, pattern thing we had here. Um, this was a slide. Uh, not really a pattern, but if you ever use a random number generator for anything, Think about if you really need to use a cryptographically secure one. Um, if you don't know, do that. Yeah, there are two kinds. Like the, the one in, in .NET, system.random, is not cryptographically secure. It's a simple algorithm that, pro that uh, produces uh, seemingly random values, but it's very easy to reverse this. If you get a hold of two uh, numbers generated by this, you can uh, reverse the, the whole calculations and then uh, get the state of the random generator and then calculate all the random values that's going to happen forever for that uh, state. So, for example, if you use that for you know, session references or cook some cookie value that's supposed to be secret, if I get a hold of two of those, I can calculate everything. And even though it's a really long number, uh, which has uh, like a, a possible you know, cos cosmological scale of uh, the number of uh, combinations, then still I can just calculate the 2,000 possible ones that uh, you uh, generated for the last 15 minutes, and I can use it to steal tokens or whatever. The cryptographically secure random generators uh, do not have this property. So why don't you always use this? Because it's slower, and it requires a true randomness from your, uh, your machine. There needs to be a source of randomness. Um, and this source of randomness, if you generate a lot of random objects, you run, run out of uh, entropy, as it's called. And then these operations start to take time because the computer has to wait for some digital noise to uh, populate the random number gener generator. But if you don't know, use the cryptographically secure because otherwise you're probably doing some premature optimization. Okay, so we still have five minutes. If anyone has any questions? Well, so we'll just compensate for the other, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> other guys. All right, thank you very much for listening. Okay. 
Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat? I, can't, I couldn't hear what, what you said. Okay, yeah, using uh, like attributes and uh, stuff, yeah. Uh, it's hard to say anything uh, general about it. If, it's, if it correctly identifies the trust boundaries, if it's easy to put these aspects uh, so they clearly show where the trust boundary is, fine, why not? Because inside these aspects, it's just regular code. You use regular expressions or whatever you do for validation. So I, I don't see why not. I, I can't see a... Unless they're hidden in a configuration file somewhere that says, okay, apply validation to all these classes, and when you're in the code, you can't see it. I think that's, that can be bad, because then you don't see the trust boundary, and you might forget it, and the validation might only catch some things and not others. That's, uh, that's what I have to say about that. No one? Okay. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.